All right, well, we return, and we're back in the book of Exodus. And after a couple weeks away, uh, thank you men who filled in, and then a couple weeks setting this up, we finally are ready to begin with the Ten Commandments. We're going to come and look at the first command, which I've summarized this way, exclusive worship, no rivals. I think if you could put in a phrase what the first and primary command is all about, it's this, that God would have no rivals in our worship and in our heart, that we would have no other gods, that our worship in that way is exclusive. And honestly, though, it's challenging because one of the most frequent objections made against biblical faith, against true Christianity, is that it's just too exclusive. Now, this is why people turn and reject the faith. I've heard it myself. I recall sharing the gospel with a lady waiting outside of a restaurant, and she suddenly broke in to tell me, you're telling me just because I don't worship your Jesus that I'm going to go to hell? And I affirmed that she understood what I was saying, to which I received a profanity-laden reply as she stormed, turning on a heel right back into the restaurant. She didn't like to hear that, that you had to believe in Jesus. And frankly, in our age of acceptance, inclusion, self-esteem, and self-affirmation, the exclusivity of Christ, it just sounds so harsh. It sounds so cold. It sounds so unloving. It sounds, in that way, so hard to believe, even for many Christians, such that you're probably familiar with R.C. Sproul. He passed and went to the Lord not too long ago, but his ministry, Ligonier, they, every few years, they conduct this theological survey. And in this case, they were talking to self-identified American evangelicals. That is, these should be Bible-believing believers, Christians, Right? And they were posed, in effect, the question, does God accept the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam? And again, this wasn't just posed to the everyday person on the street, but it was posed to supposed believers in Jesus. And when they're posed to that question, does God accept the worship of all religions, 67 67% that is more than two thirds of the respondents said, yes, he does. And to that, I'm I'm honestly speechless. Like, what? And my shock here isn't because, oh, I want all of those people who don't worship Jesus to go to hell for its own sake, mind you, not at all. I'm just shocked because it's so biblically clear. It's clear in the teaching of our Savior who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. It's true in the very first words of the Bible, in the beginning, God, He is God. There is no other. He created it all. He alone is to be worshipped. But not only in those places, but actually Right here, too, it surfaces, right in our text, in this first and primary command that's the top of the table here in the Ten Commandments, namely, God alone, the true God, must be worshipped. There can be no others, no rivals. And this morning, we're going to see that's not merely just true, that's not just reality, but it's right. We're going to consider why that is so. And really, given this command's importance, it deserves our particular attention and study once more, though I know surely all of us have heard it at least once before. But even in the church, we need to hear this again because it becomes so clear as it will unfold as we study it more this morning. We, I mean, we're gathering in a church, we're hearing the Scripture, we're, we're looking to Christ. But even us, we can know in our heads, I know the right God to worship. Uh, We can know the right church to attend. We can know the right religion to join in our minds, in our reasoning, rationally. But our hearts, maybe even already this morning, have moved already far away from worshiping God. We go through the motions of corporate worship to only then take the opportunity to think about many other things. To let other things take God's rightful place or supremacy in our heart. We serve other things, other gods, throughout the week. 
with wholehearted devotion and gusto, whether it's money or pleasure or we're after affirmation. These are our functional saviors, our functional deities. That's what we live for. That's what our heart wants. Even though we might say, oh, I worship only Jesus. And this command then calls us, mind, heart, all of us, to embrace and truly worship the only true God. This first command is a call to summarize it like this, let nothing, and I might add no one, let no thing, no one, rival your Savior's, that is key, rightful place in your heart. You cannot let anything seen as competition with Him before your heart. He must be supreme. He must be paramount. He must be what you're wholly devoted to. Him, and actually Him alone, it cannot be divided in your devotion. Let nothing rival your Savior's rightful place in your life, in your heart, in your mind, in what you live for. We'll see that play out in three points this morning as we underscore exclusive devotion. And we'll see it first as we consider His exclusive word here in verse 1. Really, our text opens with what's going to prove really the first reason why our devotion to Him should be exclusive, exclusive, wholly on Him, that why He can have no rivals. And it's namely because He has a personal word, a direct word for you. He wants to speak to you this morning. Now, before we get there, just to reset the context, it's been a couple weeks, uh, to remember where we've been in the Exodus story, because if you consider that, that where we've been, it shouldn't surprise you that God has a special word for His people, because this God is a relational God. He is actually a personal God. That's really the whole point of this redemption that He's been working of the Israelites. Remember this, just turn back a page to Exodus 19. But where we are in the story, God has redeemed Israel miraculously out of Egypt. He's got them out of bondage and slavery, but He didn't just set them free to set them free. He set them free to take them somewhere, and He took them at the foot of Mount Sinai. Why? So they could meet Him. So they could go be with God. Look at it in verse 4 of Exodus 19. He explains why He brought them, why He redeemed them. Exodus 19.4, you yourselves, Israel, have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings, and why I brought you to myself. He redeemed them to know them, and so he, they could know Him. That's called a relationship. To be His special, treasured people, taken out, and that went in exclusion of all the other peoples of the earth. They have a special status as the people of God. And it comes into full view, this special status they have, as God does something He had never done with a whole nation ever before. He speaks to them personally, directly. Now, back to chapter 20. Let's see this in verse 1. As it just opens and it says, and God spoke all these words. God spoke them. And what I'm telling you is this. This is different. This is distinct. As you go throughout Scripture on numerous occasions, we'll hear statements like, thus saith the Lord. The prophet says that, and then he gives you the quote from God. Or, this is what the Lord says. But in those cases, that the message is being mediated. It's being given to you by a messenger, whether a human one or an angelic one, by some prophet. So take Ezekiel. He had these incredible visions, and he tells you about them. Or the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. He has a vision. He tells you what he saw or what God tells them to say. But this event in redemptive history is very unique as we're here in Exodus 20. What happens here at Sinai is different. We find here God speaks the words directly to them. No mediator. This is the voice of God spoken directly into the ears of men. This is unique. This is special. And it represents this unmediated, close relationship He has with His people. 
And when you get that close to God, you can tell this is special because they have a special response. They start to get afraid, don't they? We've seen this already. They get afraid of hearing this God speak because when He speaks directly, you can't ignore it. And you start to get a glimpse of how powerful He is, how holy He is, and how you are none of those things, at least like Him. As Moses in Deuteronomy recounts their reaction, and he says this in Deuteronomy 5, verse 26, For who is there of all flesh that has heard the voice of the living God speaking out in the midst of the fire as we have and have still lived? They heard the voice of God and they survived. Now, they knew they couldn't handle it, right? They knew, like looking the sun direct with the naked eye, you can't keep doing that if you're going to keep seeing. They need a go-between. They need a mediator. They say, Moses, you tell us what God wants us to know, and we'll listen, but we can't handle this directly from God. So they say, give us Moses to go between. But even as they do, they realize this is something very special, that God would speak to us and not obliterate us that God would speak to us and we would still live. We have a special relationship with Him. And it's seen in this direct word He's given them. But furthermore, He's not merely speaking to them as a whole group. He's speaking to them out of the fire, as Moses says, to them as individuals. He has a personal word for each one as they hear the voice of God. We talked about this as we went through Matthew's gospel, especially as we're looking at Matthew 18. But like Greek, the Hebrew language has a way to distinguish whether you're talking about a you singular or a you plural. That is, it's the difference between knowing whether he addresses the whole nation at one time or whether he's speaking to the individuals within Israel particularly. And maybe you can catch on to this quite easily, though English does not make a distinction. You hear you, and you don't know if it's a nation or if it's individuals. But we live in the South, technically. And you can distinguish between you and y'all. So in the SSV, that's the Southerner Standard Version, (laughs) it's not, you all better not have any other gods, but it's you, Billy Joe. And Mary Ann, you better not have any other gods. I'm talking to you individually, not just you as a nation. And that's true throughout all of these commands and statements. Actually, it begins in verse 2 when he says, I am your God. He's not merely Israel's God. He's the Israelites' God. He is the Christian's God. Because God redeemed that individual Israelite out of the land of Egypt. Furthermore, you as an individual shall have no other gods before me. You as an individual shall not make any carved images. You as an individual shall not take the name of the Lord, your individual God, in vain, you see. This is not a generic call that just falls out there to the people. It's a particular word that God speaks directly to each individual's heart. That means, too, for us, you cannot hide in the crowd of the congregation when you hear the Word of God, you know, to try and avoid application, and it's striking you. For example, you might hear an announcement up front from the church, like maybe in the announcements later in the service. Imagine that. Something like, you know, GBC, we need a clean facility. We need to take care of it. Grace Bible Church, we need more cleaners. And you might think to yourself, that's right. Yeah, we do. We need a clean church. I don't want to go into a disorderly worship center. I don't want my kids to go to cluttered classrooms. We need to clean this place, and I'm glad there's somebody that's going to do it. Or you might hear a call to say, we don't have many people on the soundboard anymore, do we, guys? We do not. They go off to college, and they do other things, but they will teach you, you, and you, and you, not you, but you. They will teach you how to do it, and they will lead you in this. You might hear a call to the whole church, again, give to missions. 
Give to this ministry initiative. And you'll say, yeah, that's great. I'm so glad Grace Bible Church supports foreign missions. But then you never give to things like that. Or you never sign up for the soundboard or for the cleaning team. And true, maybe you can't. Maybe you can't give more right now. And that's fine. The church needs to meet the need whether you can individually do so. But clearly understand, these ten commands don't work like that. They're far more personal. They sound like, member so-and-so, you need to give to this financial need. I need you to sign up for the cleaning team. These commands understand they're not for them. They're not even in that sense for your neighbor next to you. God's word is coming to you. So church, you better listen. Now it's true, God has not spoken audibly to the church just in the same way He did to Israel. But understand this, He has clearly spoken, and He's clearly speaking to you, and He will hold you individually accountable for that. And that's even true about the Old Testament word that we're studying here. Paul tells the church in Corinth when he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, speaking of the Old Testament, especially these early books, he says, Now these things happened to them, Israel, as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. It happened about Israel, true, but it was written down so it could come to you because God has something to tell you this morning even. Christian, understand, God wrote down the Old Testament even to speak and instruct you as an individual, to talk to you this day directly. He's speaking, so the question is, will we listen? Point number two, we hear about His exclusive salvation. This is a building phrase, his exclusive word and his exclusive salvation. These are the reasons that justify why we have exclusive devotion to him. But but it's so key, before we can ever get to a command, before we can ever get to a law, God has to really clarify something, and he sets a context for Israel and for us there in verse 2 of Exodus 20. Before he ever gives them a law, he needs to make something crystal clear because he knows it's so easy to confuse. There's a proper order to understand these things. And again, it's so easy to miss. And it's this. He first saves them, then he calls them to walk in obedience. Grace comes before law, you see. Salvation comes before obedience. Justification precedes sanctification. And it is these truths that then set the stage. You see there in verse 2, he's going to talk about him already being their redeemer. These truths set the stage for all the commands that follow. It's in the context of the redeemed. You don't do these to make you redeemed. You are redeemed, and so you do these. But it's so important to stress this because we so often jump right to the 10. We jump right to, we skip through the owner's manual. Well, what is God actually asking us to do? He says, no, there's something you need to know on the front end. Before you jump to the 10, I mean, think about it. When we read the 10 in, for the scripture reading just a moment ago, how many of you didn't even really start listening until you got to the first command in verse 3? You just skip. Where's the Ten Commandments? Oh, verse 3. I don't even know what those first two verses were about. But if we skip verse 2 and go right to what just God commands, you're going to misunderstand the commands because you're going to see them wrong because you're going to try and remove them from the redemptive context. And that's what we have to see. So what is that redemptive context? Well, finally, let's look at verse 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Before he ever gives them a command, before ever he gives them a do or a don't, he first reminds them what he has already done for them. Namely, he reminds them of three alreadies, three truths. First, that he is already their God. I 
am the Lord, your personal, individual God. For every believing Israelite, I am the Lord, your God. The law then, you understand, isn't given as an entrance test into the people of God. This is not the entrance exam into heaven. This isn't a test that somebody must pass, some criteria you must meet to be considered the people, the God. These are not what our potential candidates look like. The Ten Commandments are not a college entrance exam or some scholarship criteria, you know, where you might go back and look at the average GPA of last year's freshmen. What did they do to get this scholarship? Oh, man, I need to bunch up my, my scores in the SAT. You're not looking through these metrics. Because what is he saying? The first thing he's saying is, you're already accepted. You're already mine. I'm already your God. I already redeemed you. You can't be more my people than you already are. That's why I saved you. The second thing he tells them is that they're already brought out of Egypt. That's past tense. It's been done. I already set you free. Is the third thing he tells them. He already freed them from the slavery of bondage. What's the point? He's already graced them. He's already saved them. He's already rescued them. He's already established a relationship. This isn't a ladder to get your way into God's good graces, if that phrase even makes sense. And it's so key to understand this because we are so quick to flip the order around. And then things get Not just a problem, they become damning. We misunderstand the law, and we just assume it works like this. I obey, therefore, I am accepted by God. That's what we assume how the law works. I obey God, and therefore, I am accepted by Him. I am saved. When grace says... When the gospel says, no, I'm accepted, I am saved, I am redeemed, therefore I obey. It's astonishing, really. Two simple ideas, acceptance and obedience. And if you flip the order or get the sequence wrong, it ruins the grace of the gospel. You have no gospel. It must be, I am accepted by Christ, and therefore I obey Him, and not the other way around. That is a damning false gospel. So, Mr. Israelite, before you ever get into the law, don't forget the context. Don't look over verse 2. Don't just blitz by it. I already saved you. I already set my love on you. I already delivered you by grace. I made you mine. That's the context from where you need to hear these laws and these commands. And I trust you understand, this is not just an Old Testament thing. And so the New Testament is too. God graciously, freely, mercifully rescues us from our sin in Christ, and then He calls us to walk in obedience. And actually, it's that order that becomes the very basis, a pattern and motivation for how we are to obey. Let me show you one example. Look with me, or you can just listen, in 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4 in the New Testament. I turn here because the Apostle John deals with what is probably that summary command in the New Testament. If you were to summarize the ethic of Jesus... Jesus was even asked, what's the greatest command? He said, love the Lord your God. And then the second is like it, love your neighbors yourself. How will others know you're my disciples? By your love for one another. The command that summarizes really the ethic of the New Testament is love for one another. Well, the Apostle John explores that command from several ways and angles. But in verse 10 of 1 John 4, he gives us the why or how this works. He says this, 1 John 4.10. In this is love. You want to know what love is? By the way, love is not just love. It's not self-defining. It's defined here. This is love. Not that we have loved God, 
but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the satisfaction of the wrath of God for our sins. And we know filling in the rest of the New Testament on that. God didn't wait for us to love him first. We didn't love God. We hated him. We turned from him. We rebelled from him. We ran from him. We disobeyed all of his laws. And yet what do we see? He loved us anyways in Christ. Such that he actually came himself to die for us, to take all of our sins. That wasn't deserved. That wasn't earned. That was love is what that was. And so it is from this kind of love, not merely as our model, but the actual basis of our relationship with God, that's how we're called to obey. That's how we're called to likewise love. So he goes on, verse 11, he says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. If he loved us when we were pretty unlovely, God demonstrates his own love for us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Well, that's how we're called to love. It's not because we first loved him, but he just loved us anyways. That's biblical God-like love. Or John makes it so clear in verse 19 of that chapter. He says, we love because, so here's the reason, we love because he first loved us. Again, we don't think to love others for then self-serving purposes, to try and get things from others. Nor again, do we need to love others because we think that's going to make God start to love us to get in His good graces. Again, if that makes any sense, by the way, it doesn't. We, in the gospel of Christ, have been already loved, secured, saved, forgiven, redeemed, and that was freely given, so we are free to love even the unlovely. just as we have been. So that's the context for the law. That's the context for this call of obedience. And so in that way, God's laws or even Jesus' commands, they don't come to us, you understand, they don't come as a threat. Well, you better obey. You better shape up. You better perform. You better keep measuring up. You better deliver. Otherwise, I'm going to dump you and leave you and forsake you. That doesn't sound like the gospel, does it? No, it's not. The cross of Christ already settled that matter for all that trust in Him. And so then, as one writer said, our obedience to God is not based on fear. It's not based on insecurity. Instead, when you see, when you come to grips with your sin and His love for you in Christ... You obey then because you love him back. You actually love him. You actually trust him. You're actually just so grateful he would show his mercy to you when you were so unlovable. You obey because you trust his commands. You trust him because you know he's good. And so if he would give you a command, a good, merciful God like that, you know his command is for your good. He's not out to get you. He's not out to spoil your fun. He's not out to hurt you as he calls you to be faithful. Get his commands, get this, come from that context of love. Now, to our culture's ears, that, I think that makes little sense, and maybe to us. Because we buy into the lie that true love would never put any constraints on you, pretty much ever. Real love would never hinder you, command you, put boundaries on you. And on an aside, I've just got to think, like 90% of the people that say that have never been a parent. (laughs) Sometimes, really, the most hateful thing you can do for your kids is just to let them go their own way and do whatever they want. Why? Because children, they're foolish, they're inexperienced, and they need a parent's commands, boundaries, and care to keep them safe. We get this. You know, to make them eat food they don't want to eat. I mean, as a kid, if I could have just eaten what I wanted, it would have been cookies and soda all day long. Is that what's best for me? No. In case you need instruction. Kids need to be told, don't touch the stove. 
Or don't stick things in sockets. Why? Because they're going to get hurt and they don't know any better. Let alone the rebels that need boundaries, right? And so out of love, a parent commands, he provides boundaries and protects. But of course, the way it so often works, isn't it? It's not until your children become parents themselves. We can imagine. Before they ever come to really appreciate all that's gone on. But that's just it. We've seen love. We've seen how gracious our Christ has been to us. And so then, in view of that, that's how we embrace and trust His commands and we obey Him. We love God. We love others for our good and theirs because He first loved us and called us into this exclusive salvation. Well, here's the third point that rounds it out. His exclusive word and His exclusive salvation demand an exclusive devotion. That is, so far we've been setting up the why, His word and His salvation, but now we're turning to the what. What are we to obey What are we to do? What is He calling us to do? And first and foremost, as the head of the ten, He's calling us to be exclusively devoted to Him. The principal command is captured there in verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. And this is powerfully worded in the original Hebrew, and I think the only way in English we can try and capture that is when it's translated the old way, thou shalt not, through all these commands. This is not a one-time, one-off, occasional command that's going to come and go. It's going to need to be modified. This isn't a constitution where you need amendments or something like this. No, this is a timeless command from God. It's not a suggestion, as one has said. These are not ten suggestions. These are ten commands from God, and they stand. This isn't advice. And we know this in contrast to kind of commands we give, again, to reference parenting our kids. You know, the commands we give our kids, how we deal with them, it changes as our kids, hopefully it does, as our kids get older and they get more mature. You know, small children, we require them, you're going to hold my hand across the street, otherwise you're not going to go across the street. You must hold daddy's hand. But I can say things are different now in my house. My oldest boys are much wiser now as to the dangers of busy roadways Not to mention, they're just bigger than I am. Let's just say they don't hold my hands anymore as we cross the street, and nor do I ask them to. They've outgrown it. They don't need that command anymore. But this is a command that they, nor I, nor you will ever outgrow. You shall have no other gods but Him. And two phrases in this command really capture the notion of this exclusivity in worship and devotion. First of all, it's just the command itself, you shall have no other gods. More literally, you might translate it like this, there shall not be to you any other gods. There shall not be to you any other gods. No other gods will be considered God to you. Now, I draw out this more literal translation because I think it taps into the most sanctified, the most precious, the closest of relationships in our world, namely marriage. Think about wedding vows. The traditional language goes like this, I, Rick, take you, Aaron, to be my wife. And in that way, the husband commits to take and to have this one woman to be his wife for his life. Often then added in the phrase, forsaking all others, keep yourself only for her all the days of your life. In the same way, God is calling us to have just one God to be our God, and it's Him. No rivals. And furthermore, as to place an exclamation point on it, as if it wasn't already clear, and I'm afraid it was, but it's worth emphasizing. He adds at the end of that command that little phrase, before me. 
You shall have no other gods before me. Now, in English, I think that phrase before me can be a little confusing because it could sound like you can have no other gods ahead of Yahweh, of Jesus, but you can have a whole lot of other gods. They just can't be as supreme as Him. As if you could take all of your gods, the things you love and worship, and put them in a line, and you deal with Jesus first, and then after you do that, you can move and worship and treasure all the other gods that you want. Just you got to be sure to give your first worship to Jesus. No, that's not at all what this command is getting at. The notion that we would have no other gods before him means that we would have no other gods in his presence, before his face, literally. And understand, your life is lived before the face of God. This taps into how the the pagans around Israel will think about worship. They had special places to come worship their, their gods. These were their temples. And they would have their idol, their god, in the temple, and they would bow down to it and give it worship and food and all of these things. But also what would happen is when the the foreign nation, the pagan nation, would come and attack another nation and they would conquer that nation, they would take the nation's gods, they wouldn't destroy those idols, those gods, they would bring them into the temple so that their god can show the superiority over the other gods, bring them into the presence, so to speak. Remember the story in 1 Samuel? When the Jews were battling the Philistines, and it wasn't going so well for them, they kept losing. So they're like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get the Ark of the Covenant. You know, this is the box where God met His people. We're going to bring that. That's going to be our rabbit's foot, our lucky charm, and we're going to go, and we're going to wipe them out. It's going to be awesome. Until it wasn't, and they got conquered, and the Ark got captured. And they're like, wow, that was a big mistake. So what did the Philistines do when they got the Ark of the Covenant? Well, they do what they had always done. They brought it before their god, Dagon, in his temple. But then what happened the next morning? They went into the temple and they found out Dagon's on his face. Well, that's odd. Let's stand our God back up on his feet. So then they came back the next morning. What happened? Dagon was on his face and his head was chopped off and his hands were chopped off. Why? Because the Lord would not accept any other gods in his presence before his face. To bring any other so-called God before him into his presence you understand it's the ultimate insult. It's the ultimate disrespect and dishonor. If I recall the analogy we made earlier of what God was calling Israel to, it's like a marriage. When God has redeemed you in Christ, He's called you in a marriage-like exclusive relationship with Him as your God. And so imagine taking another woman into your marriage relationship. The husband drives home from work, and his wife peeks outside and sees, oh, it's my husband's car. Oh, interesting. There's someone else with him in the car. Oh, it's a woman. And he pops the trunk, and he grabs a suitcase, and he starts wheeling it up to the front door, and this woman's walking right beside him. The husband comes in the door, oh, honey, oh, wifey, I am home, and I'm so excited to introduce you to someone, someone I'm just dying for you to meet. This is Barbie. (laughs) I picked her up on the way to work, and then we stopped at a chapel and got married. Now, rest assured, honey, you are my first love. You're my first wife, but I have more love to give And Barbie's going to live with us now. Okay? Uh, Try not okay. Try, are you out of your mind? Try, think again. Try, she needs to get out of my house, out of my marriage, out of my sight. You can't belong to her. You're mine. You're married to me. Not her. And so you're going to have to choose, Buster. You're going to choose her or you're going to choose me. You can't have both. Now, despite framing it that way, obviously there's nothing really funny about it. The shame, the infidelity, the broken promises, the faithlessness, the heartache. An exclusive commitment has been broken. And all that comes to mind 
when we bring other so-called gods before him. It's shameful. It's belittling to him. It degrades him. And God will not tolerate it even for a moment. As nor should your spouse tolerate you even getting flirty or romantic with another just a little bit. So you, Christian, you and you and you and you, understand God's calling you individually to himself and to him alone. You shall have no other gods but him, your Redeemer. And so where is your worship lacking? Where might your devotion be divided? And that's happening once we give something that is due to God from our heart and we give it to something else or someone else instead of Him. Because you understand, worship is ultimately an issue of the heart. When Jesus was asked, what's the greatest command? He didn't go to this first one, which is put in a negative way. You shall have no other gods. But he gave an effect, going back to the law, a positive expression of this when he said, what is the greatest command? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. It's the same command, just one's put positively and one's put negatively, but it's the heart of worship and it's what is your heart after? What is your heart devoted to? So this is key for us because we're in an orthodox place and yet so easily we might say all the right things, express all the right things, but our hearts are very far from the true God, serving instead, treasuring instead many other functional gods. That as as Christians and in this, in this room, we know, we, sh- we know better than to worship statues. We know better than to divide our devotion, you know, serving and worshiping Jesus, but then we'll go worship Allah, and we'll go worship Buddha, and we'll go worship the God of Mormonism or whatever other God and religion you can think of. I think every, well, nearly everybody in this room would understand that. But worship is principally a matter of the heart. And so despite what all you might Say outwardly, your heart can be ascribing godlike worth to many other different things. And it's what you're devoted to. That's your God. What does devotion look like? It's where your mind goes. It's what you think about. It's what you daydream about. It's what your hope is. It's where you spend your time. It's where you give your efforts. It's where you give your energy. And if it's not to God, it's to then whatever is your functional God thinking those things, as you invest in them, you're thinking that will deliver, that will satisfy, that will affirm, when in reality, they're only stealing you from the true God. It's like the the prophet Jeremiah spoke to Israel when he said, you know what you're doing? You're, You're rejecting the fountain of living waters, and you're going to make a pool for yourself, and it's got a crack in it, and all the water sleeks out, and so all you have on the bottom is mud. You're after the mud when I offer you myself. Because we're devoted really to these other gods or false gods in our heart. Again, to consider it a little more pointedly, what are these other gods that we bring into the worship of our heart? One pastor, I think, insightfully put it like this. What's the definition of a false god? He said, a false god is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give. So has your heart been cheating on Jesus? Have you dared to bring others into the home of your heart looking for them to give you peace, security, fulfillment, and satisfaction? Because I think you understand by now, whatever those things are, none of them will give you what you seek from them. They only still take it from you. Your devotion to health cannot save you. You will age and still one out of one people die. Your money cannot secure you. You will die and you will leave it all behind. Your wisdom cannot redeem you. You cannot outsmart God. 
Your dutiful faithfulness cannot rescue you because it cannot overcome your ills. And I stand rebuked by this, but dads, what are you pointing your kids to? What are you devoting them to? What do you talk with them about? What are you directing them to? Maybe not by your words, but with your life. What are you showing them really matters in your life? Dare I, you, dare I ask you to ask them today? Understand for any of us, your reputation, your kids, your house, your vacation, your retirement, none of that can provide lasting comfort for your soul. None of that can love you. None of that can rescue you in our greatest peril that we all have, and they can't do it at all. The only thing they do, they distract you from the real solution, the true God. That's what false gods do. Well, contrast that with the opening words of the Heidelberg Catechism, which I think gives us one of the most, it just captures one of the most beautiful summations of true worship and where it's found. Question. What is your only comfort in life and death? What would you say to that? For the Christian, it's this, that I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, not both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And it goes on. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood. And he has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. There is no other so-called God out there, object of devotion, that can ever do any of that. So why then are we divided in our devotion to Christ? He isn't divided in His commitment to us. Why should ours be? What are those things that have been pulling on your heart more than Christ? Where is your mind wandering to look for reassurance and joy? Put it down and look to Christ, your Redeemer. Let's do that now as we pray. Oh Lord, what a great mercy to find that you are a merciful Redeemer. Father, we are stricken and we are struck by your word and your law. It convicts us. And yet we thank you for the great grace seen right in verse 2. That even as the law came to Israel, they, they heard it in a context of redemption. They heard it in a context that you're a merciful God. And so we hear again your law. We are convicted, yes, but we confess that we are the ones in the wrong. You are the one that's in the right. And we claim that as we then ask for mercy in Jesus Christ. And as those who have been given mercy, we've been given all the more reason to praise you, to exalt you, that our whole life would be committed to you. So may we do that by the mercies of God, present our bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly devoted to you, our Redeemer, in whose name we pray. Amen.